It's fun time. When ordinary people back in the city are trying to describe man, homo sapien, the thinking animal, one of the ways in which they have attempted to describe man, I'm going to use as a springboard to start part one, is they have pointed out that compared to other creatures that seem to be operating on very simple circuits, creatures that, what I say, it was a rabbit, and he runs around the corner and there is a wolf, a simple direct circuit, the closest thing that you could call a rabbit thinking, which of course it does not in the sense of having a yellow circuit, but it is taking in some impression from the environment, it runs. That is the, compared to man, that I was going to use some fairly ordinary comparisons, is a simple circuit. The rabbit has no choice. Now if a man runs around the corner and there is a wolf snarling with a knife and a fork looking at your thigh or your calf, a man has additional choices. He does not simply have to run. That a man, that's the way it appears. That's where I'm starting the springboard from. A man apparently, assuming he has enough time, could consider another alternative. He might, through the neural process of looking down at the wolf, looking at the terrain, judging his own ability to run, seeing if there was some makeshift weapon at hand, a sharp stick, a man, instead of just running, would have the possibility of picking up a stick or a rock and actually attacking the wolf for whatever reason. He might decide he couldn't outrun it. It's beyond the point of us debating the words as to what's going on, but he apparently would have another choice. Now, variations of this have been used as a kind of definition a distinguishing aspect of man, the thinking animal. Uh, sure, all of you follow this, and there is some three-dimensional validity to that. And if I could have made the comparison perhaps even stronger to start off with worms, but throughout the so-called animal kingdom, you have got areas where in, at first glance you might think, well, the creature is responding to the environment. That if a little bird in a nest opens its mouth, Certain birds will feed the bird whether it's their bird or not. They got no choice. They see an open mouth and they fly off and get food and they'll come back and feed somebody else's kid if it, for some reason it got in their nest. But compared to that, a man has more choices. His nervous system seems to offer slash demand that he have the ability to consider additional choices and that at in one way you could say is a distinguishing mark between man, the thinking animal, and every other three-dimensional animal of which you're aware. The springboard being that I was going to jump from there and point out to you that so too, in a comparison, would be the revolutionist of having even more neural and thus behavioral options. Now uh, this is also, instead of, in addition to just my description of revolutionist, would cover the full gamut of what has always been referred to as mystical states, mystical conditions, being in a higher state of consciousness. You could start out, and if you can, if you were following my rather mundane, cityified springboard description, the difference in my example between rabbits and men, if you get between men in general, the people back in the city and the revolutionists, there are additional, and that's the way it appears. And follow me because if I don't change my mind, I'm going in other directions with this before I get through this taping tonight. It would apparently be additional neural options to begin with that a revolutionist would have, <laughs> than all ordinary people would have. We're not talking about simply the matter that some people have information already stored, that there are people who are now certified public accountants, and you might fool around with this forever, and you will never have some flash of insight that suddenly you understand everything, God forbid, in the world about accounting. 
that is not it. That you would suddenly know everything there was about trigonometry or automobile mechanics or whatever. But it is, in the beginning, apparently, that such an unusual person, as I'm calling the revolutionist in the state of affairs of men, would have what at first would seem to be neural options, but it would then turn into behavioral alternatives that are not available in the city, no matter how much education, no matter if you were educated in two or three areas, or no matter whether you had four or five degrees, if you were multi-talented, you would still not have the options that I'm speaking of, it's the kind of options I've been speaking of for months and years. All of the way, from worms to rabbits to ordinary men in the city, to the revolutionist. I could say that the number of choices apparently available to them would distinguish where they are in the full food and evolutionary chain. I'm sure the kid would agree to that. I heard some notice, or somebody wrote me, that it seems, that, at least on tape, that there seems to be some difficulty of picking up the kid. I don't know if he's too fast or what. Say hello, kid. <laughs> did, any of this fin did any of this finally get on tape for people out of town? Did it? Good. Somebody saw you this time. All right. As people have been wont to do, besides the terms I used, any other term that you ever heard, any term that you imagine were, was covered, such as being more spiritual, being more enlightened, being more awakened, being more whatever. All of that, if you're following what I'm attempting to start from, could be described as being people, men and women at some time, to compared to their time and place, apparently had more options. Now back to the most commonly available descriptions or comparisons, religions, if indeed there were living, mystical, extraordinary systems of some kind. Can you follow this? That although, if you were a, in the city, if we're going to compare atheist and religious people, let's just use Christians, then you could say, well, atheists apparently have more freedom because they don't have to put up those damn commandments and all the thou shalt nots. But here we go pushing properly the mechanical jello limits of 3D reality. In reality, if you could be a real Christian, a real Jew, Buddhist, whatever, you would have more options than everybody else would. you would have more options, whereas everyone else was operating as they must. You would be operating in a way that would have been, or would even now be extraordinary to your time and place, to your city, to your neighborhood. There would be more options in you available. You would be able to do extraordinary things, such as love people that say piss on you, to let people push you around, apparently, and not push back to not be afflicted by all the things that the religions say are afflictions. There would be more options available. But since these religions, as I point out, for revolutionary purposes, are insufficient, then I'm pointing out to you that what this is involved with, in a very specific way, is additional neural, apparently, is the beginning of it, apparently additional neural choices. I suggest that you think about it. You can imagine, as you might have already, your own descriptions or believe that you have profitably adopted some I have made in the past. But you have got to see this as a minimal starting place, at least for tonight, that if you could do anything out of the ordinary, if you could do anything that was simply not native to you, it would be an additional choice. 
and it would apparently start as an additional nervous system choice. That if right now, if I said, what is your biggest shortcoming? What is your biggest fault? All of you would have something to say. If I insisted, come on, tell me the truth, we've got to talk about this. If you just said, well, I've got a terrible temper. Before I got here, I used to pray about it, I used to fast about it, I used to chant, I used to read every book that ever said how to overcome your temper, and nothing seemed to work. Now, let's assume that there is any validity at all, that you would be closer to doing something extraordinary, you'd be setting up conducive, more conducive conditions to do something out of the ordinary, if indeed you could overcome your anger, your temper. Well, do you see? To overcome your temper would be the fact that you had gained, that you now had some additional neural choice. Whereas as it stands now, whatever seems to be a habit you've either acquired or a habit that you don't know where it came from, you can't describe it, seems to be native to your disposition, you seem to have no choice. And ordinary people, of course, believe that if something mystical happened to me, if somebody blessed me in some way, then perhaps I could overcome this bad habit, this fault. But what they're saying is, I would then have a choice in the matter. They don't say it that way because they believe if I had a choice, right now, hell, I'd cut down my temper. But apparently I've got no choice. That this one area, I am working on a very simple circuit, not unlike the bird feeding any bird in his nest, any kid bird. Not unlike the rabbit having no choice. A rabbit cannot. It has no circuits. It cannot stop and consider whether it could kick a wolf in the nose or pick up a stick or holler at the wolf, hey, your paws are untied, and then when the wolf is looking, run. <laughs> in that same sense, an ordinary person, when they're talking about whatever they call a fault, a shortfall, what they're saying is, I operate in this way on a simple circuit. Apparently somebody can look at me just half wall-eyed, and I get mad. Anybody can speak to me with just the least bit of vitro in their voice, and I get mad. Apparently, I'm working on a very simple circuit, and I've got no choice to do anything extraordinary such as that. Would be that you then had additional, apparently, neural choices, that your nervous system could then react to an apparent external stimuli, all the way from hungry-looking wolves to hungry-looking people who treat you in a woofy manner. That apparently instead of you operating on this simple nervous system circuit of absolutely reacting the same way over and over, that you apparently now would have an additional choice. The additional choice would be real change. Additional choice just in the city would be just this side of an FM, not a station on your radio, a fucking miracle <laughs> to have such a choice. But now I am, to you people, even speaking further off, away from the city limits, not only to have choices, apparently, that you can affect what you now think of in your internal struggle as being your faults and your shortcomings, but being able to even see things apparently even think of things in a way that, to say the very least, is based upon unnatural, that is, normally unavailable, nervous system choices. To be able to think the unthinkable. I said that years ago, and I know many of you wrote it down, and some of you have used it in your own writings. It just sounds, I guess, so neat when you first hear it. <laughs> But to think the unthinkable, you would have to have absolutely unnatural, unwired neural choices. You can't talk yourself into it. There are no experiments. There are no little tasks. There are things that I have given some of you to do to get you to see what the condition was, but it did not produce a sudden breakthrough in your neural patterns to where you could then begin to think the unthinkable. It was more to show you how locked in it was. Before I try to drag this into other areas of the bushes, let me point out the idea 
that I'm now verbally presenting of a revolutionist having additional neural choices. Several ways that you could look at this specifically based upon other pictures I've sketched out recently is that in such a condition you would not be forced totally to think, to feel, to believe and simply see as opposed to D. But under all present conditions, neurally and chemically, everything that you think, feel, and believe in is either C or D. Now we've been through this enough. If you heard any, if you have the ability, you heard this a long time ago. That under all ordinary conditions back in the city, the people, whatever they think, feel, believe in, is pro or con. It's C or D. It's apparently constructive, true, proper, or it's D. It seems to be destructive, disingenuous, false. If you had additional, apparently, neural choices, you would not be limited to that. It would be the revolutionist only, that is, someone who had, apparently, at least, neural choices that were not available, that would distinguish between that person and everyone else in the city at that person's time and place. It would only be such a revolutionist that could properly consider the factor, not just theoretical, of which many of you as I fully understand, feel is your present position. I've talked enough about C, D, and E, and in the last several weeks I've talked so much about E that there are many of you that feel as though, at least when I'm staying here talking some nights, that yeah, I see what it is. And I get a real sensation when you start talking about dragging in the E, trying to burn up that which seems to be irrelevant to get you out of this apparent, almost bottomless ditch of intellectual dichotomies. That it's not just this and that back and forth. It's not just a dance of a one-legged person or a peg-legged person with a peg leg and a knot hole going around and around and around. That if you could begin to drag in that which currently seems to be irrelevant, it would change the whole dance. But then, and I was saying many of you have this sensation, it's then like you leave and it was just me talking. It was just me conjuring up these never-never lands again verbally and that there is no particular reality to it, or you don't know what to do with it. That's because it is not a theoretical game of some kind. It is not something that you can theoretically approach. It's not something that you can theoretically accomplish and feel as though you have gained anything. It would be a matter that you would have to neurally be able when you're confronted with whatever, a wolf, one of these little problems in life, something you're trying to deal with. Under all ordinary conditions, you're better off than a rabbit, speaking about the nervous system evolution, that you have, let us say, at least a circuit, a nervous system approach to whatever this particular problem is. You're a wolf, more so than a rabbit would, or a bird or a worm. But ordinarily, your approach being more complex than a simple circuit than the rabbit's approach and reaction, it's still going to be limited to two possibilities. And theorizing is not going to change it. But if you had the ability that you had now other neural options, is when all my talk about E would be part of your reality, that you were not limited, that every time you are apparently confronted with a problem, no kind of great discussion. I don't have to, or you wouldn't have to use terms like E and D and the state and revolutions and revolutionary consciousness. It's there is a wolf. There is a problem to you. And instead of it being, well, all right, I like it. I don't like it. I could do this. I could do that. I could do this. Or I could try to do nothing. Instead of all that, you would have at least another choice which is, when it comes to it, 
verbally indescribable because if it was verbally describable, you could already conjure it up yourself. It would be a potential with you. With the nervous system of man, as it is now, it's not that complex. It would take revolutionary consciousness. It would take an unusual present condition within your nervous system for you to have apparently, in the beginning, apparently simply more neural choices, that your nervous system had more options in its reaction to what was going on than the people in the city. There is a way in which I could say that the revolutionists, the real revolutionists, would have as a motto along these lines, as he would be saying, if it ain't irrelevant, it's of no interest, <laughs> no value to me. <laughs> now that's one that I guess at first blush could sound like a Kairu type one-liner, but you should also try and grasp the reason I brought that one liner up is of course if you have a nervous system that has more choices that are normally available then that which I am calling the irrelevant is no longer irrelevant mm -hmm. but looked at from the ordinary limited or the lesser number of choices that an ordinary nervous system would have if a revolutionist was trying to describe things that he might be taking into consideration as options or if, for whatever reason, he decided to make some comment about his behavior. If he said, I know that you was watching what I was doing and what I just seemed to have done in relationship to that, I saw you look at me like I was nuts. If anyone who understood that had any occasion then to try and verbally respond to it, what they would be responding to would be pointing out that what I was taking in consideration is what you consider to be the irrelevance which is the only way that what I just did makes any sense. You keep thinking that two and two is going to equal five, and it doesn't. Whereas my particular two and two took in at least a number one that was laying back here in the irrelevant. It was laying in the part in the loop that simply goes through the 3D world, and I took it in consideration. So what looks to be insane, of course, somebody could do this, does not go around talking about it. I'm, doing that so that you can try and see another glimpse of it. They would have to say, I had to take into consideration that which you don't even see, not just mystically. I wasn't taking consideration the wishes of the gods that only I can hear. That's what people used to call it. What I took into consideration was what you think of as being irrelevant. And the only reason I could do it is my nervous system has more choices than yours. That is why the tomato sounds cute, and that's why it would be insane at the 3D level. It would nonetheless be true that the real revolutionist could say, if it is not irrelevant, it's of no interest to me, because it's of no use. If it's relevant, it already fits in to the standard number of nervous system options that everybody has. And I would simply react as I always reacted. And that doesn't interest me anymore. I've already read that book. I've already heard that tape. Not just once, I've heard that tape. God, I've heard it so many times I could throw up. I've already seen that picture. I've already seen the movie. I do not want to see it again. It's of no interest whatsoever. And of course, if it's of no interest to a revolutionist, remember, it's not useful. Something else I could say about the revolutionist, the revolutionary area, and that is that the recruits, people that would be revolutionists, should be camped in a place where nothing is indigenous. <laughs> you 
you all remember what indigenous means, that, that which is native to an area, that which is original, and is even used in the sense of being from a country, but it's native. To really be a revolutionist, you should be trying now to be count. The way I put the recruit should be count. So I might quick I'll point out that is of course on the nights we meet, the nights we're taping for you other people, that I at least verbally and then whatever else chemically may be going on, trying to push you toward that area. <coughs> but where you'd be camping in a place where nothing is indigenous, which 3D wise is unnatural. 3D wise, I guess somebody, I guess, could point out that that is impossible. Yeah. That something is indigenous to everywhere. <laughs> that's what I hate, that's why I hate dealing with little bitty minds. <laughs> the kid said amen to that. There's people who say, well, it's impossible to have a place where nothing is indigenous, that something is indigenous to everywhere. Don't bother me with logic. Don't bother me with pea brained reason. I am telling you that the recruit should be trying to camp in a place where nothing is indigenous. And to carry it a little further, I could say that if you were able to support some of the revolutionary zeal in yourself, then you would know what I'm talking about. It's like not staying anywhere. It's keeping on the move. It's not taking anything that you ordinarily think, feel, your ordinary behavior. It's all indigenous. It's not thinking the same thing twice. If I thought it, it's indigenous. And it was indigenous, of course, to the city. It's indigenous to where I used to be. If you're satisfied to where you used to be, why are you taking up my energy? What are you doing with this? What the real bushes would be, would be a place that you are almost, your three-dimensional self, your line-level state of consciousness would in a sense be disoriented all the time. It, it would always feel as though, where have you taken me now? <laughs> it would be a continuing state, using what seems to be the intellect alone right now, it would be a place that would apparently, that the mind would always be picking up beggar lice, always hitting thorns, bushes, Ripping back and always hitting it in the eye is always wet, damp, fleas. That would be a place where nothing is indigenous, a place where nothing is common. There is no inherited familiarity. It would be a place in which everything that is known to you about yourself up until now would find to be discomforting, disoriented which are really strong words, because from the other view, the revolutionist finds it fun. From a certain kind of 4D perversion that's no longer perversion, the 4D sense of awareness would find the 3D's awareness and squirming around, I hate for it to sound like whips and chains time, <laughs> but finds it sort of funny, which is allowable under these conditions because it's you not somebody else actually hurting or some other creature, it's you. But boy, I sure would like to be mad. Yeah, I know you would. <laughs> I could just cry. Boy, that comes as a surprise to me. <laughs> I, I could just cry and fall on the floor, you know, if you'd just let me. Right, you, you, you stay right here until I go to the bathroom and we'll, we'll think about it. Whereas when you can reach a certain place, your ordinary self knows that that's a lie. Well, it takes a long time before, it, I can't say it ever gives up, but it knows that you're being a smart ass. <laughs> it knows that you're being insincere. Or there's another way that I may get into tonight. You can scare the hell out of it by apparently being chemically too sincere. But at any rate, you have got to finally reach a place that you understand what I mean, that you sort of frighten yourself. You frighten yourself, uh, 
your other self, one of those small me's, know that I am not to be trusted. That is your revolutionary I. <laughs> it almost finds you to be dangerously unpredictable, which is only possible looked at from a view of humans having X number of neural choices. I say that being one of your me's, one of your people, and then another one of you, a real revolutionary I, a would-be recruit, having neural choices, they're not available, and if you exercise them, they appear to be in what? Sane, right, kid? Insane. Dangerously unpredictable. I like that better than insane because some of you have skated so close in the past you thought that you don't really like to hear me say such things, but that shows how close you're still living in your own face to worry about it. Only real, real sane, bourgeois, brown shoe brain, white sock sensibility, people <laughs> worry about going crazy. You don't understand, most of you don't, what a low level of perception is required to wonder whether you're going insane. <laughs> If you've got any perception at all, you know. You got to be really common. You got to really have brown shoe brains, drip dry awareness, polyester, to worry about I could be going insane. I wonder if I am. I'm not trying to make any of you feel bad. But you could use that again as one of many benchmarks to have any extraordinary perception, you know what ordinary insanity is. And there's no doubt whether you are or whether you're not. Of course, is everybody, all of you aware, I assume it's still accepted in psychiatric circles, but that used to be one of the proofs that you were nuts, if you could state dogmatically that I'm not, because all psychiatrists were taught in psychiatrist school is Always be kind of humble and even verbally noncommittal about your own state. Always point out that all of us, before we graduate from psychiatry school, have to undergo a kind of analysis ourselves. That who among us can say we're absolutely sane? And if some guy in the back says, well, I say I'm absolutely sane, since he is always in the vast minority, then the psychiatrist looks at everybody else like, ooh. Now that kind of fanaticism is a dead giveaway. So, of course, if you know that, we're back to 4D worlds running through the 3D world, and of course there are things you cannot do with ordinary people. And so even if you know, even if you personally understand the difference in the city between sanity and insanity, better than all psychiatrists put together, you don't say about yourself. You don't do interviews anyway. But I am pointing out, in the secret recesses of your nervous system. If you want another way in which to judge what's going on with you at any particular time, if you're sitting around wondering, am I nuts or not? I could be crude and say you are, but it's worse than that. If you can sit around and wonder to yourself, am I nuts or not, you're back in the city. You're back in the old neighborhood, you're back in the minor leagues, you're back playing your position, you're doing nothing. But, well, I was joking about this kind of interplay between one's apparent selves inside. Is there would be a kind of frightening unpredictability. Because if you've got more choices, you can do things that that other side of you cannot do. The people in you. That the people in you, when a certain thing happens, that you react to it as the way most people in the city react. That it either makes you cry and you feel like you've been crushed, or you get real mad, and if we're using psychological kind of terminology, you get real mad and play like, well, I don't care. And that's it. Somewhere within that easily observable range would be your reaction, you falling in the bell curve of the same people back in the city's reactions. And here it is, it happens, and if you did anything that could be observed, perhaps you do something 
that just seems unrelated. Well, it's like that great story I used to tell you people about the man, well, he'd had some, you might say, limited experience to mystical groups, some activity similar to this. It was another time, a few years back, and it was another part of this planet. And he was driving one night, it was well after midnight, and there was a kind of a torrential storm going on. He was driving down this deserted highway, and he looked out, and there stood a man, just a pair of pants, a t-shirt, and I'm talking about a torrential rain. And the man is standing there, right off the road, where the right away goes down, about knee high down in what amounts to the gutter, and he's just standing there, and the guy stops the car, picks the man up, he gets in the car, and he asks him what in the world he's doing out there. And the man says, well, he says, as you know, I do reupholstery work. <laughs> the guy who told that story assured me that to him it had some real meaning. And <laughs> for some reason it came to mind as I was trying to give you some kind of additional push about in the areas where there might be neural nervous system choices that to say the least are unpredictable. I don't know, it just, the story finally came back to mind. <laughs> One more way that I could point out what would be a distinguishing mark if you understood it right, that your nervous system, if you were indeed in the revolution actively, that your nervous system would have, apparently, neural choices that other people do not have. One final way in this section that I was going to point it out is it would seem as though your genes then would no longer have the normal original chokehold. <laughs> they didn't like that as much as the guy in the rain. <laughs> I don't think you feel bad, but even the kid didn't laugh at the guy in the rain that was a bit upholstery and the home. <laughs> well, now into um, one of your favorite areas, a question for you. It's back in the city when people say, when the people say, back in the city, back in you, back in the state, back in the city. Y'all remember that? When the people say that something is impossible, does that signify that they lack the means to do it, or that they lack the resolve to do it. What is it when the minor league players, all the people in you, the me factors, and they're always saying this. You know what I'm talking about. They don't have to say the word impossible. They don't have to say anything. But they are continually saying, not just here. Here they get a good workout and work out get a real good sweat doing this, but they do it out in life continually. That, hey, that's impossible. What other people have just asked of me, what I seem to have asked of myself, and as I said, here is a place to really have the water come up to ankle level in your socks, is all the things that I apparently seem to talk about. Of Jesus, it sounds all right, but then it's impossible. When the people say that, are they signifying, I don't have the means to do this, or are they actually indicating, I do not have the resolve to do this? Seeing as how one question is never enough, let me ask you this. What do you think about this? Do you think that a real revolutionary actually ever lacks the means? 
I don't take that as waving a superficial egoistic banner just because you're attempting to do less that you can do everything in the world. I still don't attempt to walk on the water and I've never attempted to repair a kidney tear on myself with duct tape. But would it be true that anything, if you were not limited, if you were not living in the city, if you were not you, can you hear a reality of that, at least what I'm assuming would be what you think is the answer to the question, that the real revolutionist would ever be in the position that, as opposed to having the resolve, that he would lack the means? Not to do the three-dimensional impossible, but everything else that the people in him, the people out there even say is impossible. You can't do that. If not morally, you can't do that because that's not the proper reaction. When you get hit and your naughty parts were a two by four, either get real mad at the people who did it or fall down and scream and holler for a few minutes. But do not get up and tap dance and try to tell me stories about some guy driving late at night in a torrential rain. Do not treat me like this. It seems dangerously unpredictable. What the people are saying is, I lack the means to do otherwise. Well, what do you think? What do the people in you say? If I run across something, at least once during the night that we're taping, and it really strikes you, and it even brings up some example in your parent own, own what do they call it, kid? Life, your own life. And it just really strikes you that that right there is an answer. Just that strange thing he just said, I can take it out of an allegorical way, or I can take it from what seemed to be a real crude way, and I can make it allegorical. Anyway, there is the answer to how I could handle that problem. And yet then it seems as though, after there's no doubt, it strikes you as being an operational director. That there is there's just no doubt that is true. There's maybe more to it. Maybe I'll understand it better next week. But right now, I'm going to operate on that basis because it would extract me from what seems to be this present difficulty. And then it seems as though you lack the means to do it, right? In other words, you say, well, I, I'm going to try it. And it was all the way from I couldn't remember it. As determined as I was to use it, as much as it struck me at the time, I couldn't remember to use it. You can take that as being a pretty weak impossibility. Two, your old minor league player saying, we tried, we tried, and it didn't work. We, didn't, we just didn't have the means. There must be a trick. It sounded right. When you said it, there must be a trick. Topographically, I either suggest or challenge you that whenever something is said to be impossible, people are either talking about, I don't have the means to do this, or I don't have the resolve to do this. If resolve sounds too fancy, of course you could look at resolve as equaling a kind of disindigious need. It would have to be a kind of unnatural need. It would have to be a need that was disindigious. That's why I probably made up the word. <laughs> disindigious need, I'm suggesting to you, would equal Resolve. That got too sticky. It would have to be extraordinary need. It would have to be need as far as the requirements of living in the city, that is, of you being you for the rest of your life, then you did not have such a need. You would have to be extraordinary. You would have to be out of the standards, needs, requirements of people living in the city to have such a resolve. So if ordinary people, if the people say, all right, this is impossible, and their choices are, as I'm saying you, it's impossible either because you don't have the means to do it or you don't have the resolve. 
do you see? When I was trying to hint at, by making up my word of disambiguous, it would have to be that you had the possibility of exercising an option that no one else had. That would be a disambiguous need. That you had this possibility that had no rationale, was not required, was unpredictable, unexpected, and apparently by all standards in the city was not even necessary, that nobody needs to have that kind of option. If they had it, nobody would do it. That would be resolve. As I said, if that, me using the word resolve, if it threw anybody, it'd really be a kind of exceptional, non-indigenous hunger of me saying, do you actually need this? Or when I use terms like people are properly attracted to this. So if that is not the question, we're back to my second rhetorical question when I said, would a real revolutionist ever like the means? Not three-dimensionally. If it's possible, he would not like the means. It would be a matter of whether you like to resolve, whether you have the need to do it. Oh, all the little phony baloney players in you may say, yeah, we want to stop this, we want to stop this, we want to change. If you're actually involved with a revolution, it's not a matter of you lacking the means to. I'm saying it's impossible because I don't know how. If it's impossible and you're actually involved with a revolution, it's because you lack the resolve, not the means. And that's true whether you believe it or not, which is a great thing about this. Does everybody remember a few times back that Kairut told a story about the little kid that somebody asked him, do you believe in fate? And the kid pondered a minute and said, if I say no, will it go away? <laughs> At the very minimal level, if the people in you say something is impossible and I say there's only two possibilities, to say it's impossible, either you lack the means to overcome this impossibility, or you like to resolve. And at the very least to say, well, to resolve the hunger, the hunger would be that nothing is impossible. And to say, well, I would try to do it, but I'm not sure really what the means are. At the very least is don't believe in it. The very least is like, uh, I would like to lose weight and uh, I'm pretty well convinced by now, after 52 years, that everybody else is right, that if you put less food in your body, <laughs> then you'll lose weight. So you cannot say that I lack the means. I think I've been drinking too much caffeine. What is the means, at the very least, to put it verbally, to stop it? The kid had it. It's to stop it. A revolutionist never lacks the means. Many of you who doubt that, of course many of you are to a point now you're afraid to really try this out, but if it's really serious you can write me a note and say, all right, I'm determined. There's something about me that I'm just sure would be beneficial if I would change it, but it seems to be impossible. That I have the resolve, I have the hunger and the determination, I just lack the means. If any of you still are that uh, call yourself whatever you want to. Then you can still drop me a note and, and say, tell me the magical means, and hell, I'll tell you. <laughs> but don't write me and don't ask me unless you're serious. Because when I tell you, I want you to do it. And then you see. You won't like it, because it might be as crude as you say, how do I stop doing so-and-so? Or you may fall for the old joke about, I've been doing this all my life and it hurts. How can I stop it? And you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> the means are always as close as your own elbow. It's a matter of the resolve. It's a matter of whether you have the ability for extraordinary nervous system choices. Because if you've got the choice, you finally got to exercise it. In regards to what I could call a revolutionist kind of secret activity, at least 
in regards to the general activities going on in the city, the revolutionists would sometimes, from external observation, seem to agree, submit, to even cooperate. But as in regards to the general activities in the city, and at other times he apparently would not. I bring up such apparently observable behavior variations, of course, to try and point you somewhere else. And somewhere else is this, that some opponents apparently to be conquered must first be obeyed. <laughs> some apparent foes to be dominated must first be submitted to. Could you see that this requires, if you could do it, and those of you giggling, something is striking you in the chemical lab already, would require that you have an unnatural set of neural, at least, apparently, neural choices. I repeat, compared to the general activities going on in the city, in everyone's city, what the people are in general up to, all predictable, all within a bell curve, compared to that, the kind of secret actions that the revolutionist is involved with, then in regards to these two, apparently the revolutionist himself, or of course herself, but apparently at times, even to these most bourgeois, Z activities in the city, he would apparently sometimes be agreeing with, submitting to, and at times even cooperating with. That is the way it appears. And I'm not saying otherwise, but three-dimensionally. But there are some opponents, whatever that may be, that for them to apparently be conquered, they must first be obeyed. That there are some apparent foes, whoever that may be, out there, in here, who knows? We'll know in a minute. <laughs> that for them to be dominated, they must first be submitted to. All right. In the binary mechanical balance scheme of things back in the city, you know this. But you can divide up everybody out there and everybody in you into those that apparently are driven to dominate and those who apparently are driven for the hung by the hunger to be dominated, the need. Their resolve is, I've got to submit into the lead and the leaders and to those that apparently are driven to dominate and those who apparently are driven for the hung by the hunger to be dominated, the need. Their resolve is, I've got to submit into the lead and the leaders. You could apparently try and take this to a little more complex verbal level and so I, there are forces in life, people, forces, institutions, ideas, attitudes, that one should resist. And then there are those that one should submit to. But now back in the city, you do know this by now, that whatever's hollered out, let's all be Buddhist, that half the people are going to say, I agree. And half the people are going to say, not on your life. And if they holler, we should do away with the present king and elect his brother-in-law. Half the people are going to say yes, half the people say no. We should do away with capital punishment, whatever it is. Apparently, the idea, the institution, just half the people, to keep this simple enough, 
are going to feel as though I should resist this. And at least half are then going to say, we should submit to it. If you had another alternative, do you realize for the first time in your life, those things that seem to be problems to you, the kid was ahead of me, he said, wouldn't it be nice not to have to make up new neologisms? Well, you wouldn't make up a new one, it is a new one. Why don't I just not call it anything? What if you had one more choice? A problem happens, whatever your choices are now. I've already told you, you but if you just, if you can't think about it and you don't take my word, you got two. If any problem you got. One seems to be better than the other one. What if you had another choice without me naming it? But do you realize this? As long as the feeling is, that this problem, which would be an apparent foe of some kind, whether it be exemplified by a person, by a group of people, by a process that seems to have gone on between you and even an institution, a church, the IRS, your family. The feeling is I've either got to resist what's going on, that's part of the problem, or I've just got to go ahead and submit to it but neither one are pleasing. And if, but one always seems more pleasing than the other, but if one of the me's and I, if one of your people is driven and they seem to be in the majority, that they submit to this foe, then the rest of them feel as though they have been betrayed. The other half feel as though you have taken all away, away all my energy. I have no resolve. We should not have submitted. We should not have given in so quickly. What if the unpredictable, the normally unused choice would lie in such a way that from external observation, from your own observation of you, the people, is that, all right, rather than struggle against this, which seems to be my mechanical want, I'm not saying this in theory, you'd have to have some idea of how you're doing this, but listen quick, as sticky as this is getting, is that you first apparently give in to it, and that that is the way, that that is actually another choice, because everything in you the majority of the people would have never done this. Never, never, never. It was not one of your choices. You could have verbally, that is, neurally said, well, under these conditions, me and everyone else has the choice to either do this or that, to struggle against it or submit to it. But they don't. You don't. Because to do the one that you would have never done was a new choice. that you can apparently submit because to conquer, in some cases, you have got to first apparently submit, that you have to first apparently obey before you can rebel. Well, if that is not sticky enough, which it obviously is, let me try and point out a little more. That's where I was really going with this, but it is really going to get sticky if you're not going to listen any better than you are. This happens. This is a part of doing this. This is a part of dragging in another dimension, dragging in the irrelevant. It is a part of recognizing and being able to use what would amount to this multicolored wheel in a 3D sense, flowing through a two-dimensional field of reality and you see this constantly changing, appearing and disappearing. Stuff that's inexplicable, this magic that seems to have no beginning, no end. This would be in having additional neural choices. 
And here's the kind of effect it would have that I was saying is even stickier and thornier. Is ordinarily, B follows A. Am I correct? Yes, you are. Ordinarily, effects follow causes. But now, I'm determined to go on with this. I may have to come back to it some other day because not many of you are with us, are they, kid? If it may be necessary at times to first apparently submit before you can conquer, then what if? Thinking of action might actually follow the action itself. <laughs> what if the thoughts about how to handle a sudden chemical fire up in the lab? although it's not consciously perceived as such, but what if the thoughts about how to handle this, the plans about how to handle it, only come to one after the flare-up? Three-dimensionally, this is not possible, but you're wrong. Could you glimpse, just for a second even, Linearly speaking, that is, in the 3D world, how plans might actually succeed the actions. <laughs> if any of you ever begin to get a glimpse of this, then you'll see why there is no such thing as predictable cause and effect, and why it's limited to mathematics in the laboratory that is not possible to human consciousness, ordinary consciousness, in the world of human events, human behavior, that psychology must to even try and pass itself off in the city as being, you know, fuck a science, even an art, why they must deal with predicting the behavior of inbred rats. They cannot do it with humans. And nobody even questions them. Well, it's no longer psychology of humans, as it was first called. They just have neglected to update it. It's the psychology of rats. <laughs> it's the psychology of simple circuits. Of course, now I guess you understand I'm not attacking psychology as serving a purpose, but it has nothing to do with explaining the human being. It has to do with predicting simple circuit behavior. But now I think it is off times, am I not correct? It's called behavioralism, the study of behavioralism and of psychology, at least in undergraduate, if not graduate courses, is to predict simple circuit behavior, not human behavior. But back to where I was, if you could get a glimpse that it's possible that what appears to be linear cause and effect, that it's possible that the plans actually succeed the actions that they apparently, from a conscious view, from a 3D view, that they are apparently addressing. But if you ever get a glimpse of this, then you know why there is no predictable cause and effect. You would also understand why you cannot learn from your mistakes. They came first. <laughs> <laughs> Where I started this section of saying Compared to what I was, whatever it is I mean by secret 
revolutionary actions compared to the ordinary activities in the city in the struggle against whatever seems to be your immediate foe, your own habits, your own shortcomings, the power of widespread habit, the lack of means in the city, the lack of general resolve and hunger that seems to overcome you, whatever seems to be your proper foe at the moment, to conquer it, which seems to be without any doubt what I must do. Someday I have got to overcome this one thing, that to do it, compared to the way it appears to be, to conquer it, it may be that you have to first apparently submit to it, which sounds to be backwards. And then I ask you, can you conceive, can you even get a glimpse of the fact to what, from 3D consciousness, from a 3D view, to what appears to be plans about something may succeed, not precede, they may succeed the very thing that they are apparently planning about, preparing for. I was going to try and drag it down to even a cruder level, but those of you that take this as being some kind of real science fiction, or perhaps I have overstepped the bounds and had too much coffee tonight. A long time ago, I told you, and I've repeated it once, that there is a view from which this is solidly correct, and that is that consciousness is the last to know. I started out this evening at great length over and over saying that the revolutionists would apparently, 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 in a neural sense, have more choices. Apparently, in a neural sense. If that's all there was, how easy would all of this be? All you'd have to do is have a new idea. You would, all you have to do is find me, somebody back in the city on the street corner, Somebody says, who in here wants to change? Or here, who on the street? Everybody on the street, a bunch of them, you're standing there on coffee break. And you go, well, I would. And he says, all right, does everybody in here have a real personal problem, a bad habit that's really mucking up your life? And you say, yeah. And the man says, what you must do is go home, stand in the bathtub, run the water up at least above your ankles, and stick two fingers, the first two, in a jar of peanut butter and go mm. <laughs> or we could strike out that kind of apparently insane behavior and he could just say all problems you got to remember this all problems to the gods were a test that you passed yesterday <laughs> the idea <laughs> This apparent idea <laughs> The apparent idea then you could say has changed you if it did and then all we'd be dealing with was whatever seems to be need to be changed would be something that you could put in neural activity that I or someone could tell you, or as Kyrie pointed out, you could tell yourself that I am angry too much and it hurts me and therefore I will stop being angry because I read or I thought myself and I agree to it, but maybe I read somewhere that Cosmic forces do not like angry men or women. There you are. Does everybody remember where I started before you started laughing so much? If it was simply a neural process, if it was simply a process of information for the mind, everybody would change just like that. Everybody would go to some religion, whatever religion you grew up with, by the time you got to the age that you were curious about these important questions, you would go there once and ask the priest, the rabbi, the minister, and he'd tell you, or he'd show you their Vedi Mecham and say, read right here, and you'd read it and go, oh, and that'd be it. <laughs> in other words, if it was a matter in the city, at the ordinary level, of conscious information, if that was it, 
we'd have stopped all this how long ago? Well, about the first night you and I met each other. The first time you ever read a book. The first time you ever asked your mother or father, hey, why does the boy down the street kick my ass around at school? He would have given you some answer. There would have appeared to be verbal neural information, and that'd been it. It wouldn't really matter what if it seemed to be new to you. All of that I was bringing up again to try and point out to you that it is not simply a matter of, of neural choice. It appears to be. It appears that that is the one thing, or the one distinguishing factor between you and every other creature on this planet, this part of life's body, this part of the universe is part of life's body, that it is our neural activity, that our nervous system has reached a high point into the cerebral the frontal lobes, the cortex, that no other creature has, and we have more choices. There are more demands made on us. We can think possibilities that no other creature can think. That is why we are so complex. That is why we are higher up on the food and evolutionary cha chain. I am trying to get you to see that there is a distinct possibility. I can almost prove it when I can drag your consciousness out of the city for a few moments. But I can flash it as happened to a few of you tonight that it hits you and it's almost frightening to what appears to be this linear run that things seem to happen and you seem to want to react to it or you want to make plans not to let it happen again or you want to make plans, proper plans for you. You're trying to search your choices of how to best react to what happened. Theoretically, a lot of you, or most of you, let's say, heard in some strange way that it might be possible that you might have to first to submit to an apparent foe before you could dominate it, that you might first have to give in before you could win. Now, I was trying to drag you from there well, you might get a glimpse of what appears to be the linear run, the time flow, that something seemed to happen, and then I seemed to make plans and want to react to it. Or you can look at this either way, whichever way helps you. I'm trying to make plans for something that may happen. I'm just almost sure, and I need to plan for it, that all of that in a three-dimensional sense may be backwards. It's not really, but it may be backwards. And what appears to be the plans may succeed the actions about which you're apparently making plans. I didn't really want to have to go back, but let me take you back when I stopped this paragraph to last week, if you were this two-dimensional creature living right here with just a slit, and there was this, like a wheel, divided up into sections of different colors, and to you, apparently, red came down in your field of consciousness, followed by blue. If you were at another dimension, if you were conscious of an additional dimension, you would see that it is spurious, it's really spacious, that it apparently is true, but it's not, that the person at the two-dimensional level, that blue always follows red, because if you got above or outside in a three-dimensional sense, you could also see that red follows blue. But it's from their view that they got no choice. The wheel keeps going this way, but you can look at it to see where the wheel is, and it would be just as true that the positions were reversed. But that is not the way, at the limited consciousness of these fictional two-dimensional creatures, that is not the way it would appear. Apparently, it is always the intellect that is screaming about chemical fires going on in the lab. It's the only revolutionist that might see <coughs> that the matter might be reversed. A 
Now let me try a little more. No, we'll change the subject. But for, never mind all that, we'll change the subject. Let me remind you, if I never made it clear enough, of this. It's another unrecognized topographical reality that in the city is imperfectly perceived, is imperfectly measured, and that is ordinary consciousness doesn't realize it, but all of man's inventions back in the city, all of his institutions, all of his goods, everything that you might ever want, nobody ever thinks about it this way, is limited. I can measure it for you, and it's never considered. And the people would argue with this. I might get a few of them after they had a drink, and they might go, oh, well, yeah. But that doesn't mean anything. The limits of all inventions, institutions, the operations of all the institutions, from commerce, manufacturing, the military, the religious, are all limited to the spectrum of three di the three-dimensional five senses of man. Anything that you could want, that you could buy, that you could steal, that you imagine that you might do to yourself for self-improvement, that you might gain from somebody else, it's limited. It's absolutely limited. There's got to be some sensual stimulation of one or more of the five senses. Then past that point, that is never considered. Back in the city, what is forbidden, what your forefathers and some of your current fathers still call sin, is likewise limited to three-dimensional, the world of three-dimensional senses, the five senses. You cannot sin except one of the five senses. And if you didn't think about that real hard, you would have, if you were an ordinary person back in the city, sin in the full sense of the word, being inhumane, unreasonable, uncharitable. But sin would seem to be something fairly nebulous, spiritual, at least psychological. And it's not. There is no sin unless it has to do with one of the five senses. Then what I was going to ask you for the, this paragraph's musical question. For life's general purposes, can you see that what is normally called sin, and I'm pointing out to you is limited to the five senses, is always in some way either of one sense, something that's a stimulation of one of the senses is either a now, this is the way it appears in the city, is either in, for that particular sense, some particular stimulation of that sense, is either a misuse, an overuse, or a disuse. But it's always of a stimulation of some kind, an activation of one of the senses that some neighborhood in the city some religion, some moral code, says that if this sense is stimulated in one of these three fashions, either not enough, too much, or in some way that doesn't seem right, <laughs> then it's a sin. But everyone takes, and you don't have to be religious, which now you're supposed to be simple circuit religious anymore, but everything that seems to be forbidden, everything that in your city, in your state, everything that seems to tell you that there is a proper way to live in life, to treat other people with a proper attitude to have toward life, toward the cosmos, 
you're talking about the same things as I like to feel a woman's ass, I like to eat Ben and Jerry's ice cream, I like to hear James Brown, sometimes I like to hear Hendermuth, I like to smell uh, of a furnace that just came on, of roses. What I leave out? And I like to see, if nothing else is available, photographs of a woman's ass, a field of roses. That's it. People imagine in the city, without any kind of what should be proper analyzation, that sins are something beyond all that, and they're not. I got a second. Think about it. Think about the Ten Commandments. That's as good as any. Every one of the commandments falls within one of the senses. Everything does. And you have got to believe. That has got to be part of your hardwired belief system still, your limited choice, apparently, in your own neural system, that there are things that would stimulate my senses, that make me to smell, feel, hear, touch, taste, and in some way what I'm doing can either be overdone, misdone, or undone. It is not in the vague feels that in some way I'm going to offend the gods. Your religion, people in the city, some of the institutions may believe that this particular thing is offensive to the gods, which is the basis of religion back in the city, but the offense is not ephemeral, it is not spiritual, it is not vague, it is based, it is limited to, it can't escape from something that affects in the three-dimensional world your five senses. That's the only way that you can experience the forbidden, the sinful. It is the only way that man invents, that is the basis of all the institutions, that is the basis of everything that you could want in life that would fall into the category of goods, stuff, and it's never looked at. That's what somebody wants in life. You say, well, I sure would like to succeed in my profession. Well, what do you mean? Well. What is my profession? Well, I'd like to be a uh, writer. You know, what does you want out of it? Well, you know, to be recognized by my peers, to be well known. Uh, you know what? Well, even there I can stop if I have to for you. To be well known is what? Well, I can walk in a room and people say, ooh, there's so-and-so. If you can't hear them say, ooh, there's so-and-so, what good is it? Or if you walk in a room and not only are you deaf now that you're a famous writer, but you're blind. <laughs> If you were just deaf, you might walk in a room and still see everybody go. <laughs> and you'd still know they're talking about little old me. But you're blind and deaf, and you walk in the room. What's the good then of being a world famous writer? Number one, 10 straight weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. When you walk in a room now, how do you know you're famous? <coughs> There's nothing vague about it. Everything that you think you want, everything in the city that the people believe individually that would make me happy, they have got to be able to sense it by one or more of the everyday common brown shoe senses. What I want to do is be a great spiritual leader. Same shit. How do you know you are? Well, it'd be something, I don't know, it would it'd give me great internal joy. No, it wouldn't. <laughs> Not if you didn't know it. You write this great spiritual book to help the whole world. We're just talking about back in the city now. And the day after you send it to the publisher, you're in this horrible wreck. Let's jump forward 18 months. It gets published. People all over the world are reading it. All the people who read Jonathan Livington Seagull, all of those people, Plus, their neighbors now have read your book and they're carrying it around and people are crying just to see the title of it. But now since this wreck that happened, you're blind, you're deaf, and your nervous system is such that you cannot now even feel braille. <laughs> you are now, this country's, this part of your city, you are the most beloved. I mean, compared to you, people would throw rocks at Billy Graham. You're the most loved, admired spiritual leader of your generation. 
but you can't see it, you can't hear about it, they can't even send you a message in Braille that your book is just turned over the whole country. That person would not believe that in some way they have done something of a great spiritual nature and that the guides are shining them. Have I not carried it far enough? It's not to make anybody feel mad, it's not to diminish the purpose in life, but it's to show you in the city that everybody keeps forgetting. They have to forget. It just sounds as though it is either too depressing or it's turning man into some kind of lesser creature. Everything in the city that can be imagined, everything that can be wanted, everything that can be desired, plus everything that may feel as though it should be avoided, is sensual. If you can't see it, hear it, taste it, smell it, or touch it, you can call it anything you want to. And you can believe that there is a difference between hearing a woman say, come over here and drop your pants, that there is a, to say the least, a difference between that and hearing a voice that says, hello, this is God, and we've been watching you. You can say there's a difference. <laughs> but now, before the tape runs out, when I started this section, I said, we're going to do something completely different. As always, I lied to you. So, try and stay on board right quick. All of you think you got, that you followed that a little bit better than the last section. But now let me point out, if man is unique amongst the creatures here, if man is unique because of having additional nervous system choices, and what I want you to see is his singularity is still chemically based and not neurally because I have laughed around once or twice in other areas and said that from a certain view, could we consider the mind to be another sensual organ? We can, but another sense, but it's not. What seems to be the mind would be more as the I interpreting what's going on with the me's. Because in the sense of see, hear, touch, smell, and feel, taste, the mind is not one of those senses. And so if man has a singularity, it is not in the nervous system section that you call the brain. It's somewhere else. If he is singular, I refer you back to my story of the chemical lab. And I refer you back to the possibility of what seems to be going in a linear direction that one thing seems to cause another. That man, inventions, institutions, history may have apparently gone from a more simplistic position and gradually got more complex. That certainly happened. But back in the city, you may be looking at it backwards. I hint to you at least several times a year. I laugh. I use it some other way. The stories, the stories all over in every city on this planet, in every state, stories that man at one time was in a better position. The Garden of Eden, Atlantis, other planets fooling around with the gods themselves and in some way have gone downhill. Could any of you even perceive of this possibility? And I'm presenting this now as a real question. Let's don't be confused. Don't assume I'm hinting anything. That this obvious, back to a simple place, undeniable, indisputable feeling that everybody has, it's true in everybody, that there is a split in me. There is a division between something. Could any of you perceive of any possibility that this feeling, this split, 
could be a kind of dialogue between chemical eruptions and neural voices. I don't guess you could, but if you could, let me tell you this. If you're a gambling man or woman, there's a sure shot there. Or there's a sure bet there, assuming. That the guys running the table do such things as spin the wheel and then call the winning number. Assuming that's still true in the three-dimensional world, then there is a surefire bet on my question of you trying to just get a glimpse of any possibility that this feeling of an inner division could be a kind of dialogue between chemical eruptions and neural voices. Remember, that's where I started this last 90 seconds. That if that were in any way valid, there's one place to put your money, but that is only true if the dealer lays down the card and you're playing blackjack and he says 10, not the other way around. Because if it's the other way around, you have walked in, of course, to a revolutionary camp where they're gambling. And then all of this is moved anyway. I start out saying for the fun, but it ended up in the swamp with you, didn't it? I was going to run well, another half dozen areas, but the tempo got cut in half. It looks like I'm going to have to conclude the tape shortly, and I will force a wrap up right here. This is still tied to, I'll make it be tied to an area that I mentioned several times back. That is responsibility. Numero uno is always looking after, always protecting. I at all cost. The real revolutionary I, and not the mere me's, not the people. Not the people, not your family people, not the people in you that love the family, not the people in you that feel tied to your culture, your religion, your race, your sex, your background, any of the me's, any of the small time minor league players. A part of everything I've been talking about tonight has to do with the fact that you have got to look after job number one. And you don't have to be the Ford Corporation and look at job number one as being quality. I could have stolen that, but why when I can make up my own? Job number one is to look out after I. You've got to look out after the old number two. And this kind of protection can come about through 3D directions, descriptions, this kind of looking out can be done with thought or it can be done with feeling, apparently. You cannot properly look after yourself. You cannot properly protect yourself if you do not understand that the apparent sequence of events in the city are not the only possibility. If so, you will forever be apparently reacting to what happened to you. You will be living out your life apparently 
mumbling some kind of pseudo revolutionary jargon by such by claiming such things as well at least that was a learning experience it was not a learning experience you are not going to learn from your mistakes because it's going in the wrong direction you cannot protect yourself after the fact you cannot protect yourself based upon the number of choices that you have ordinarily you cannot no one can half the time you feel like you've been dominated some of the times you feel like you won it's like you are at a gambling table but at the in the best of circumstances if you are right in the center of the bell curve that defines the people back in the city if you're right in the center the best you're going to do apparently throughout your life is that half the time you hit blackjack you beat the, or at least you beat the table and half the time you bust and there are very few people right there in the center of the bell curve but that's the best you could do it's half the time you feel like you are riding the camel the other half the time what the camel's riding you half the time apparently you almost push people around even if you don't use those terms you apparently were got in a situation that could have been sticky which back in the city all situations can be sticky and apparently you got out of it and maybe it hurt somebody else maybe their feelings got a little hurt but at least you got out without any great psychic damage to you but the other half of the time no matter what you do no matter how decent you try to be it's like half the time other people do hit you in the naughty parts with blunt instruments that you do get mistreated you cannot protect yourself your choices are limited you either pick up a stick or you run the wolf either slobbers maybe bites you or he doesn't catch you this time and there is no choice you cannot learn from your mistakes because you're apparently planning based upon something that happened you cannot prepare for new mistakes because you're apparently making plans for something that's yet to happen <laughs> that is not the way it is operating you cannot protect yourself by being predictable you cannot protect yourself by being reasonable you cannot protect yourself by any known means in the city anything they teach in the city will not help you you cannot protect yourself if you can't see that you can't see anything you cannot protect yourself by either being just aggressive or submissive in other words just using C or D will not protect you protection will be a kind of dangerous unpredictability not just for other people there would have to be choices in you that are not commonly available remember I started out choices that apparently are neurally based that apparently something happens to you that immediately you sense this could do real damage to me psychically my own little spirit could be crushed by this I could be damaged by this so apparently it's neurally that you decide all right I should strike back I should tell the people who insulted me the same to you I should try and get revenge or let's see I should try and I don't know either forgive them or at least they don't like the kind of foes I should be picking on so maybe I should just take my lumps and try and forget it so apparently the way to protect yourself is either through C or D either through taking some kind of action or taking no action either through perhaps attacking directly or running you cannot protect yourself on that basis and if some of you suspected this is I'm trying to drag you somewhere close to where I was threatening some weeks back when I do this protecting yourself because it's not what you imagine it's not what you've ever dreamed of but as I stated several times back when I first brought this up I'm telling you a fact you've got to learn how to protect yourself in a certain way that none of you are doing many of you I know feel as though 
that your life right now in general is better than it was, that apparently since you started fooling around with me and this, just apparently your luck has improved a little. That either people do not pick on you as much as they did or else perhaps now you don't take it as personally. That now you don't let your mother upset you so much when she calls. Or now if somebody questions your ability at work, you apparently do not feel as crushed as you used to. That may be true three-dimensionally. But that is not real self-protection. And I'm telling you, you reach a certain point and you have far beyond these three-dimensional words, you have got to be able to make a general egotist look like Albert Schweitzer. Now, it's not that you get seen doing this. Remember that. But it is a Truly, it is a fourth dimensional, it is an improved, it is a more complex selfishness, which everybody is operating on that basis. They've got no choice. This, we're not talking about humans now. We're talking about life. But you do know by now, you people have got to have some passing sensation that the Albert Schweitzers of the world are serving the same kind of institutions, the same kind of mechanical forces that the Adolf Hitlers are serving. The Albert Schweitzers, the Jesuses, the Moseses, the Sister Teresas are not nice guys and nice gals. And the opposite of Mother Teresa is not Big Daddy Amin. It just apparently is. In you, in the state of your own state, the feeling that, all right, somebody insulted me. And you don't analyze it this way, but the chemical reality of life's own body and its own balance is that you should live to play tomorrow's game. And if life allowed you to try and get revenge on this person over here, this other part of life's body that apparently just mistreated you, you could get your little short-stopped ass kicked into oblivion, perhaps into the grave. And therefore, neurally, apparently, you may say, well, I'm an intelligent person. Now, I'm not going to forget what they did to me, but at least I'm smart enough. I'm not going to bring it up right now when he's got that baseball bat in his hand. I'll wait. Maybe someday I'll be able to take a shot at him in the dark from behind. That is the same thing as people believing that they're charitable. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about people making decisions. When I say that you have to look after yourself, you do not know what that means. It is not a matter of being three-dimensionally egotistical. That's why I start out making the joke saying the reality of it will make ordinary so-called egotism look like nothing. You'd look like Mr. Rogers. <laughs> because you're doing it on the basis that there is not a new choice. And you do it on the basis of the new choice that the only thing that will keep you with the revolutionary resolve is you cannot get bogged down into either being crushed or wanting to be crushed. You can't get bogged down into those two choices of I've either been hurt and I'm going to get revenge or else I'm going to try to either overlook it or I'm going to try and be in some way spiritual and forgive it. When you're dealing with those binary decisions, that is not protection. It's only two choices. You feel like, well, I've been hurt, but I'm in the game. All right, give me one more card. You're either going to go burst, or you're going to hit blackjack. Yeah. That is not protection. Protection is you've got to be dealing in the area that is at least dangerously close to the frighteningly unpredictable. And it is not neural choices. And it has nothing to do with being good to other people or being bad to other people. Those are reflections of neural concepts. It is close. I'm not going much further tonight. I don't have to worry about it since the tape's running out. No matter how intelligent you may appear to be when you're well slept, fed, and dressed, 
and you're going to run back in the lab when you hear noises. And of course, you hear them once it's too late. You think there's some kind of line of cause and effect, but never mind that. And you run back into the lab and with nothing but the power of your intellect, the power of your words, you say, bad fire, bad. <laughs> naughty oxygen, naughty, naughty. And you over there, you helium, I know what you're doing. I know it, no, down, down. <laughs> if you're going to do that, you might as well get a tent and become a faith healer and start hollering, out, you demon spirits, out, demon rum. Out, you demons that made this person have kidney problems. You might as well. If you knew what you're doing, you might as well be laying hands on people and saying, I command for all of the unbalanced lithium to come out of this person. <laughs> the time is really about to run out. I'm going to just tell you one more time. There is a way in which none of you yet understand it. And I'm trying to drag some of you up gradually because you're at a place that some of you have got to understand this and it will help expand the ability for you to make additional choices but I am telling you that you run up to a place that you have got to be more protective of you than any 3D imagination any 3D picturization will ever tell you You've got to do it. Life itself demands that you do it, or you're revolutionary. Resolve the need that you have will be very quickly diminished. It will feel as though neurally you'll have some story that, well, this was fun for a while, but it seemed like I heard all he had to say. Or this was fun for a while, but Jesus, here I am now, I'm well over 40. And I don't know, it just seems like that those kind of things are not as important. I don't feel that stirred up about trying to find the great secret and all of that. You have got to learn that this gets down to. I'm giving you a fair description. I just don't want to choke it one time, that this becomes a matter of, I've got to look after me. And this doesn't require that right now you feel as though you are in some real, observable, personal struggle between you and some other aspect of life, between you and some other group of people, that you are right now in the midst of some real turmoil. It doesn't have to be that way as far as you neurally observe. But it's there. There is a struggle going on. It's going on within the life itself. It is trying to turn everything back or bring it back to a certain kind of three-dimensional level of equilibrium, mechanical. It cools you down. It brings you back into, if you're ever outside of it, the heart of the city, back into the ghetto where you were born, back to the position on the very team on which you were born seems to calm you down that you no longer need to be sensually, molecularly stimulated. No, it's stimulated, upset. Who needs this? It, it used to, I don't know, it's kind of fun. That's why I'm talking about that there is a protection, there is a way in which you have got to understand that nothing Nothing comes before me looking after me, and you've got to know what me is, or I is, the revolutionary I at that time. You've got to know what the protection is, but you have got to have that. If that is not job number one, you will be finished. Nothing, nobody, no words from any of your lower circuits, no matter how strong they are, for one second, can take your resolve anymore, or you can get finished. You can get finished just like that, as melodramatic as that sounds. You can be wiped out 
just in a split second. And it's all been leading to it. Your whole life was arranged in that way. The structure of life in the city is such that no one, it's not a choice that's available, no one is wired up to really look after me. The kids you thought was the most selfish in school, people that you now think are most selfish, the guys who will deal with insider information in Wall Street and make a killing at everybody else's expense, whatever would strike you as being a really selfish person, they're not. You may think that that's in some way different than the villains, the anti-heroes of history, that an Ivan Bolsky on Wall Street is different from a Mussolini. No, they're not. It's your perception of it. In some section of the city, it's their perception, and that's your perception. They're not selfish. You have got to be revolutionary to be selfish. To protect yourself, you have got to be extraordinary. Ordinary people cannot protect themselves. Ordinary people are not selfish. Ordinary people are not dominant or submissive. They just apparently are, just as you apparently are, all the people in you. It is real magic. It is real revolutionary activity to be able to look after you. I will wrap it up. You look after you at the expense of any and everybody in the world, except it doesn't cost anybody else anything. The only cost, but the way it appears, literally, the way it would appear if the people could see it, if three-dimensional consciousness could see it, is apparently you look after you in the least little way at the greatest possible expense to anybody, your mother, your children, your so-called best friend, anybody. Talking about the way it appears now, at three-dimensional level. But it got down, it looked like it was going to cost you a cent as opposed to it could cost your best friend over here, your best friend, been your best friend for 30 years. And if you let this happen, it's going to cost you a penny. And if you don't let it happen, it's going to cost them $350,000 and wipe them out. No one else would have a choice. You've got a choice. Of course, you're at the level then, you've got no choice. It costs your family every cent they've got compared to costing you a penny when it gets to be the revolutionary currency. And yet, as I said, the reality, it costs nobody anything. But that is the way, that is what stands in front of verbally, neurally. People understand this when they first are confronted with it. It gets to a point in the most spiritual thing, if I must use those terms, the most awakened, the most enlightened, the absolutely revolutionary demand is that you do look after you at the expense of everybody. There's no exception, there's no discussion. It's not ordinary morality wherein there are always exceptions. It is not any form of situational ethics. The hell with the situation. It's me, me, me. There's, no, there's not room in any lifeboat for anybody but me. Well, if there is, it's got to be the point that I don't even notice them. They don't take up any room. They don't bug me. Their breath's not bad. They're not going on in my water. It's me, me, me. It's me first, me second. It's me always. That's it. But it doesn't hurt anybody. It doesn't cost anybody else anything. But in the city, it's impossible because it does cost. It's inconceivable. That's the original cost. It's not right. There's the cost back in the city. It's not humane. There's the cost. It's not Christian. It's not anything. It's not acceptable. 